It happened. Mike is dead. Kidding. Mike's not dead. Well, not yet, at least. At the end of the last episode, Phil woke up to find Mike gone and a note from his missing brother. So long, Phil. It said. Didn't want you to have to say goodbye again. But Phil doesn't want to leave his brother to die or suffer from a cold. If that's what he's still choosing to believe alone, so he sets off on a journey to find him. And by journey, I mean he jumps in a DeLorean and has to choose him. If you're gonna go find your dying brother, you might as well do it in style. In the most affecting moment of this season, finally, Mike screams to Tandy that he's the most childish, selfish person he has ever met. These words sting for anyone who's familiar with Jason Sudeikis as an affable ever dude, and doubly so for Tandy. It's a vicious brother-on-brother -brother attack, but also a moment of noble sacrifice. Mike doesn't want Tandy to witness his drawn-out, agonizing death, and after all of his pleading is for naught, he realizes he must drive him away with cruelty. That's what we in the business call a Harry and Henderson moment. Mike makes a bruising choice of word, but even in its performative harshness, the criticism contains a few grains of truth. Tandy has indeed been childish throughout the series, and particularly so this season, as the reunion with Mike brought out his adolescent competitive side. The disgusting half beard clinging to the side of his face, like an aborted sloth fetus, has grown more densely symbolic as it's grown scraglier. Tandy's outright refusal to admit he dislikes his brother's a major barber job, even in the face of total obviousness, epitomizes his juvenile inability to be honest about his feelings. Tandy is acting like a child, and his crucial breakthrough in this episode, an emotional head-shaving scene that nimbly walks in the line between ironic and unironic intimacy, could mark the beginning of his coming of age. Keep up with all the latest recaps by subscribing to our channel. That illusion of coolness disappears as soon as Phil gets to Chosen, where a couple of pee-filled water bottles fall out when he opens the door. Dude can stop anywhere and pee without fear of public shaming and or arrest, and he chooses to do so. Say hello to Pig Phil. He's going through something pretty traumatic. So, so he gets a pass this time, and the situation worsens once he finds Mike lying still in bed. The virus got him. Phil assumes he was too late. Then, psych! A very alive Mike wakes up, scaring his poor brother. Once a prankster, always a prankster. Back in Malibu, the fallen cow's calf is mooing up a storm outside. Everyone gathers outside to check out what's happening, and there they find the drone. This must be a satisfying moment for Gail, seeing that no one believed her when she told them about it a couple episodes ago. For everyone else, it's terrifying. Also terrifying, the jar of Phil's fart that Mike finds in their family's attic. See, Phil once farted into a jar because he wanted to see how long a fart could retain its smell. That fart has now been chilling in the glass jar for 30 years, so it's time. Phil opens it up and Mike ruins it by farting at the exact same time. Again, once a prankster, always a prankster. That's 30 years of signs down the tubes. Phil laments while he's busy mourning his busted experience. Mike passes out, and this time it's not a joke. Later, though, he asks to call Truth on pranking after Phil pretends to have the virus himself. He's too tired and too sick to handle it anymore, and he ends up asking his big brother to just be honest with him. So Phil is. I don't like what you did to my hair. He admits in what might be the season's most shocking confession. The two then return to the attic, where they light a bunch of candles as Mike even out Phil's haircut. As falling slowly plays in the background, of course, if they weren't brothers, this would be beautifully romantic. But they are, and so the moment ends pretty quickly once Mike explodes at Phil for staying around. He calls him childish and selfish, and tells him he's messing with his death. Maybe he means it, or maybe he's just being so nasty because that's the only way he thinks he can get Phil to leave. All it does, though, it sends Phil to their backyard, where Mike later finds him to apologize and praise him for restarting society. He also finds his mother and father's graves and realizes that Phil had to bury them. There's a stone there for him too. I thought you were gone, Phil explains. I didn't know what to do. This is the final straw for Mike. 
who doesn't want his brother to have to go through saying goodbye to him again. It's his dying wish for Phil to go back. So that's what Phil does. He packs up his DeLorean and says goodbye to his brother again. As a parting gift, Mike gives him a new bottle filled with his own fresh fart. You can open it in 30 years, he says. We'll open it together, Phil responds, knowing full well that that's extremely unlikely. But he's not in complete denial. He hands Mike a double bag full of his balls to keep as company. No one should be alone on their deathbed. With that, he's gone and back to Malibu, where Melissa has shot and killed the drone. That doesn't mean it's over. In the final moments of the episode, Gail spots Bolt with some hairy guy, aka the guy Mike first befriended when he landed back on Earth, and another guy, and another guy. They're all wearing hazmat suits, carrying guns, and soon they're heading to shore in an inflatable boat. Oh farts, Phil says, oh farts indeed. Last Man excels at this kind of darkly funny old fart moment that reminds us how dire this wacky character situation really is. And this season ended on a couple of great ones. These potentially combative new people could start a war, or they could turn out to be the chosen crew's new best friends. Mike could die, or he could eventually return better than ever. Network comedies tend to tidy things up, but this one does anything but leaving tons of potentially heartbreaking, potentially heartwarming possibilities open for its next season. Fox renewed Last Man for a third season back in March, so adventures in parenthood aren't far off for Tandy, Carol, and Erica. There's no shortage of potential for Tandy's craven hijinks either. Nobody moves forward without retaining a little bit of themselves, so he's probably not above the occasional serotonin. However, the other cliffhanger that 30 years of science sets up doesn't hold as much luster. Mark Boone Jr.'s reappearance as Pat Brown from Pitch Black is clearly intended to create some suspense. But when Malibu residents see heavily armed men in containment suits and their blood runs cold, we remember that Pat is just an extremely cautious man, not a psychopath set on murdering them. Boone joining the cast as a regular seems rather likely, considering how the writers have essentially replaced that essential seventh row time and time again, from Phil Miller to Mike. For now, it's better to dwell on the great symbolic significance of objects in Last Man on Earth. More often than not, these totemic possessions have slightly conveyed the pedestrian, petty ways that the Malibu gang has let itself go in the years since they had a societal standard to meet. The bottle of white wine surgically affixed to a girl's hand, Tandy's Margarita Pool, the festering lagoon of human excrement in Tandy's chosen backyard. All of it reveals that once humanity wasn't around to hold its composite parts responsible for things like sobriety or basic hygiene, such values cease to be necessary. Tandy gifting his deformed ball pals to Mike represent a bold step in the opposite direction. By letting go of the crude bodies that kept him sane in his darkest hours, Tandy admits two things. He's prepared to leave behind that slummy bachelor lifestyle, and Mike must take his journey alone. Looking back on this second season, Last Man on Earth has matured into exactly the show that network television needs. The first season was a breakthrough, fearlessly defying the basic tenets of TV structure and flitting between various genres without committing to anyone. It was a work of narrative putty, liable to change shape any given weeks. The show really found its identity in season 2 as it learned to work with a well-stocked ensemble and narrowed its focus to the big ideas, brotherhood, grief, and responsibility to oneself and one's own. Ford and his team of writers still have some plotting issues, as the 18th episode order resulted in loop the loops within the show's overall trajectory. But Last Man has a distinct voice and a good head on its shoulders. In turns bleak, surreal, deliriously funny, and poignant, this season verifies Ford's major talent. His brilliant comic creation has matured with undeniable sureness.